You've read uh, Kevin's work in Slate, Forbes, Self Magazine, and more covering science, health, parenting, and how these all intersect. She's, she was recently featured in the documentary Science Moms, focusing on five women that are on the front lines of the struggle against those anti-vax, anti-GMO, pro-woo, celeb moms. She's the co-founder of March Against Myths, promoting science and biotechnology. Let's give a warm round of applause to Coven Synapathy. Please, come, dear. Is that it? No. Hello, can you hear me? Good. Let me know if I'm too loud. Um, before I begin, I think Abby's not here yet. But I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, my anxiety and OCD in this talk. So I'd like to thank her for justifying the anxiety that I have around my son's balls. So <laughs> thank you to David and the organizers for putting this together and for having me here. Um, I've heard that there's going to be video on YouTube, which I've been telling people. Um, I have something to say to the larger skeptics community but especially to food world skeptics, which I think has implications for free thinkers overall. In part, I need to issue an apology for my role in shaping a scientific, or excuse me, a specific movement, the pro-GMO movement, and for the mistakes that I made in leading that movement. It's been burning a hole in my chest uh, for months now, and I thought that Free Thought Day was the perfect venue to articulate this. I'll explain in a few moments, but first, I'll take a few minutes to tell you more about myself, since it's relevant to what I'm about to say. I was always an atheist. I was born in 1982 in Washington, D.C., to atheist parents, who immigrated to the U.S. a few years before I was born. But um, as I've talk to a few of you about as we've chatted face to face, I wasn't actually part of any organized skeptics or free thought movement, nor did I really consider skepticism as a formal mode of inquiry until very recently, uh, just about eight years ago in fact. Um, until then I was only peripherally aware of organized skepticism. And that's because until recently, at least um, in my mind as a teenager and then a 20-something, um, there was nothing that drew me to organized skepticism. And then, long story short, in January of 2011, um, when I was 29 years old, everything changed. It really did. And that January, my daughter was born. And this is going to sound dramatic, but this is how it felt to me. Holding the crushing weight of that six-pound, nine-ounce life in my hands really, really messed with me. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it messed with me so much that it triggered a condition known as postpartum OCD, essentially the onset of OCD symptoms following um, uh, the birth of a child in moms or dads. And it was like a tidal wave of pathological fear. It was like the fear that any new parent experiences, but magnified many fold. I was constantly terrified 24 hours a day of harm coming to my baby. And to dampen the explicit and horrific scene playing out in my mind's eye of my baby girl dying of SIDS, I would tiptoe to her crib at all hours of the night, when I should have been sleeping, to place my hand on her body and count her breaths and gaze at the rise and fall of her tiny chest. I had to count five breaths, and if I wasn't sure that I counted the five breaths just right, I took my hand off of her chest, and then I did it again, and again, ad nauseum. Another example, to dampen the vivid image of my family dying in a fire, I would tiptoe to the stove at all hours of the night, touching the stove knobs in multiples of five again, and staring at them to make sure that the stove was off. When you're in the grips of OCD, you know that you're personally responsible for preventing 
these almost prophetic visions from coming true, even though you know in the rational part of your mind that what you're doing is ridiculous and not at all rational. I find it equal parts chilling and fascinating in retrospect, um, which is p part of why I've written about OCD several times. But um, before I was diagnosed with OCD, in those first few crucial months of motherhood, the information was coming at me in all directions, um, the way it comes at all parents, uh, maybe since you know, many generations ago, but especially today. My family, my friends, and the internet were all telling me that everything was full of toxins, from the products in my home to the food in our pantry and, um, and the clothes on my baby's back. And looking back at this pivotal time, there were two possible outcomes, at least on a macro level. I could either, A, fall headfirst down the path I was starting on and perhaps fall irre irrevocably into a rabbit hole of woo. Um, combine that with OCD and it could have been bad. I truly shudder to think about it. But instead, I found the skeptics movement and I found Zoloft and it led me to option B. I clearly remember opening uh, a copy of the baby book by Dr. Sears, which I had received as a gift. I couldn't have known uh, at the time that Dr. William Sears, known as the father of attachment parenting, was also a proponent of a lot of unsubstantiated fear-based parenting ideas. Now, a disclaimer, I don't think all tenets of attachment parenting are bad. For example, I think it's great if you want to breastfeed your baby. I also think it's great if you want to combo feed or formula feed your baby. Hashtag fed is best and shout out to the fed is best foundation. I think it's great if you want to wear your baby, but the implied and sometimes explicit message from internet forums associated with attachment parenting and its tenets went something like this. If you don't exclusively breastfeed your baby for at least six months, then you are risking damaging her for life. I later found out that this is not true. The internet told me that if you let your baby cry even a few minutes at a time, um, you're risking damaging her psychologically for life. I later found out that this isn't true, despite all the times I held my bladder because my baby was crying. I was told, even before I had my baby, that if you have an epidural to help manage the pain of childbirth, you may end up getting a C-section and you may end up messing up your breastfeeding relationship with your baby. And that is also not true and may I add, really sexist. The alarming claims were seemingly endless and I was tired and terrified and just thinking about harm coming to my baby could send me into a cycle of knocking on wood and checking and rechecking stove knobs and door locks. But then I came across the first skeptic blog that I started reading, Dr. Amy Tudor's Skeptical OB. And I give her a lot of credit for putting me and countless more like me on the right path and I've told her, I've told her so. So soon I was devouring more and more skeptic content which I did in my free time for almost three years before I started writing for a then new skeptics blog, Grounded Parents, uh, a, sister, a sister site to Skeptic. I realized then that I had an opportunity to help other parents feeling overwhelmed by all of the predatory and harmful parenting misinformation that seems to drive a prevailing parenting culture of chaotic and nebulous fear. I wanted to do my part to help make new moms and dads not feel so guilty about the decisions that don't really matter long term and empower them to care about what does matter to them. Another long story short, my work found an audience and then more audience and it, audiences, excuse, excuse me, and it was clear that I was resonating with people. And nowadays my bylines appear at a number of different blogs and news outlets where I cover food, health, science, and parenting, and I speak to audiences, including skeptics and free thinkers groups, 
um, industry events and universities about these issues and about science communication and why people believe disinform disinformation. Um, and now I'm getting closer to the point. Back when I first started blogging, uh, around 2013, 2014-ish, um, one of the most fraught issues making waves in the parenting world um, and the food world was GMOs. Now disclaimer, I'm about to start talking about GMOs for the next several minutes, but I'm not here to discuss the safety or equivalence of genetic engineer as a, engineering as a crop breeding method compared to other crop breeding methods. I'm speaking from the assumption that genetic engineering is as safe as any other breeding method because the vast body of evidence shows that it is. I'm gonna be talking about how the conversation around GMOs has gone astray and the larger, Im larger impact on the skeptics movement. So as a new parent, I'd started hearing rumblings about GMOs. The stories went that GMOs were the weapon that big agri-corporations used to control us and keep us sick. GMOs may be responsible, the story went, for pur purported rises in rates of autism, cancer, allergies, and more. They were causing the pesticide, uh, the rate of pesticide use to skyrocket. And I learned that it was better to stay on the safe side and buy organic um, since the USDA organic program didn't allow organic or doesn't allow organic farmers to grow GMOs. And GMOs is in quotes for a reason, and I'm getting there. <laughs> well, as I learned, GMOs, or at least what people perceive as GMOs, were being unfairly demonized. I learned that there are companies, individuals, organizations, and industries with financial and or ideological motivations to systematically mislead the public and demonize GMOs. And the more I learned about it, the more I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. And so I did, and I still do. I wrote blog post and article after article on how GMOs aren't the cause of the myriad problems attributed to them. I tweeted about it until my fingers were sore. I explained in every single way possible that if you're against genetic engineering as the culprit of the aforementioned ills, then you have been systematically misinformed by those with a vested interest in doing so. Among the many verifiable facts that my allies and I often share are a few that I'll state here now. So all crops, including those sold as organic and non-GMO, have had their genomes manipulated by humans using methods ranging from traditional crossbreeding to exposure to mutagenic chemicals and radiation. So in essence, even the stuff labeled non-GMO or even heirloom has been genetically altered past recognition from its indigenous ancestor. GMOs aren't the only patented crops. Practically every commercialized grain, fruit, vegetable, and type of livestock has a patent on it, including items that can be sold and uh, grown and sold as organic and non-GMO. So-called sustainable farming practices are not exclusive to organic farms. The revenue of Whole Foods, even before it was acquired by Amazon, and at the time a leading corporate opponent of genetic engineering, rivaled Monsanto's revenue. Um, another fact, the gen genetic engineering saved the Hawaiian papaya and is resurrecting the American chestnut tree from the brink of extinction. Genetic engineering can save the diseased crops of subsistence farmers in the developing world, like the starchy banana known as matoki in Uganda, which is being wiped out by banana wilt. And um, last but not least, and also um, not limited to this list, GMOs have not caused one documented illness ever. I even co-founded a, a science activist organization um, March Against Myths. Shout out to my co-founders, David Sutherland and Dr. Carl Haravon Mogul. And we wanted to counter what we called, or call, pseudoscience injustice. The first campaign, which lasted three years, was called March Against Myths About Modification. You may have seen us in action 
if you happen to watch the Food Evolution documentary, which came out next year, or next year, la last year, and was narrated by no none other than Neil deGrasse Tyson. But the first ongoing March Against Myths campaign grew out of the impetus to put an end to the pseudoscience injusted perpetrate injustice perpetrated by one specific and wide-reaching organization. You may have heard of it. It's called March Against Monsanto. And boy, is March Against Monsanto not actually a march against Monsanto, um, which is now Bayer. It's, it's hard to oppose anyone who claims that they're anti-Monsanto. I, too, take issue with a lot of Monsanto's business practices. But it turns out that March Against Monsanto is not only anti-Monsanto, but anti-vaccine, anti-agricultural genetic engineering, and promotes all manner of harmful drivel, including cancer conspiracy theories, ableist conspiracy theories about autism, and the notion that mental illness can simply be meditated away or treated naturally, and so on and so forth. The list is actually quite long. So that first year of our counter-protest, May 2015, our allies around the country and the world, including in California, literally marched against the March Against Monsanto. And we yelled chants that we were rather proud of, and, and still are, I guess, like, two, four, six, eight, biotech is really great. And what do we want? Safe technology. When do we want it? We already have it. But by the third year of our counter-protest, there were barely any March Against Monsanto folks to counter-protest. We had confirmed reports from multiple locations that nobody showed up to march where their ranks were strong just a handful of years ago. And I don't want to make causation out of correlation, but we do take some hard-earned credit for that. Um, and the pro-GMO allies who came out year after year to counter protests in the streets and day after day to correct anti-GMO myths on Facebook and Twitter and comment section, they were and they are fighting a good fight. And I salute them. And like I said, I also wrote and still write lots of articles about GMOs. I wrote about how the non-GMO project is ruining my shopping experience. I wrote about how the anti-GMO movement has a social justice problem. I wrote about how the anti-vaccine and anti-GMO movements are linked and cause preventable suffering. And soon I began covering the growing pro-GMO pushback to this movement. When Triscuit, for example, adopted the non-GMO project label, people objected and loudly de declared that they would no longer buy their favorite woven wheat crackers. I covered the backlash when Hunt's Tomato began using no GMOs in its marketing claims. People were showing up on social media to lambast Hunt's for misleading consumers because um, A, there are no GMO tomatoes on the market anyway, and B, non-GMO claims help perpetuate anti-GMO sentiment, which fuels policy that can keep beneficial GE traits from reaching the farmers and people who need them. So as you might have gathered, I took and I still take a lot of issue with the non-GMO project and non-GMO labels. I specifically took issue with the companies with non-GMO labels on their products and their demonstrably systematic false advertising suggesting that non-GMO means everything from better treatment for farm workers to better for the environment and for health. None of that is true. A non-GMO label doesn't tell you anything about the conditions of farm or factory workers that made the product or the pesticides used, environmental impact, which corporations were involved along the supply chain, whether there are patents involved on the crops, healthfulness, or anything else. Um, and all of these issues are important, but non-GMO labels or GMO labels tell you nothing about them. All it tells you is that the whole food or ingredients in a product were not derived from crops created with modern molecular genetic engineering. So this vast misdirection about what GMO means 
and doesn't mean is egregious, especially coming from organizations like the non-GMO project, whose labels appear on tens of billions of dollars worth of products a year. And without question, a lot of my work on this issue made quite an impact. I'd clearly emerged as a leader in this seemingly cohesive pro-GMO movement. Soon, as I started shouting from the rooftops about how I was avoiding any products with the non-GMO labels, more and more skeptics and rationalists started following suit. And nowadays, I often see people on the internet denouncing companies for adopting non-GMO labels. And that's a good thing because industry shouldn't cave to obvious and harmful misinformation. After years of me and my colleagues pushing for it, it's almost surreal to now see so many people uh, speaking out about why genetic engineering is one important tool in the toolbox of agricultural techniques that together aim to feed the world's growing population while preserving our planet. So this is great, right? This, is, this was certainly my goal, or at least I thought it was. But something feels wrong about this stronger than ever pro-GMO opposition to anti-GMO. And this is where my apology comes in, and I hope I make sense here. As much as I stand behind the factual accuracy of everything that I've written and said about genetic engineering, I need to apologize for the role that I played in turning the pro-GMO movement into what it is today, which is stronger than ever, but I believe it's overstepped its bounds. So don't get me wrong, I still firmly believe that genetic engineering is a crucial tool to help nourish our growing population in a sustainable way. But here's what's so interesting about GMOs, excuse me, GMO, and what gives GMO so much power and what I only had a nebulous uh, awareness of until recently. GMO represents a lot more than just genetic engineering. It's a, sh it's a social construct. Like any social construct, what GMO means can vary from person to person. And it's precisely for this reason that the polarization around um, GMO has done us no favors. Seriously, if you want to see all of the nuance and critical thinking get sucked out of a room, just say GMO. The nuance is gone on all sides. GMO is positioned both by design and by happenstance as a spoke around which conversations uh, about the food system spin. And because food is one of the foundations of life itself, it is powerful. GMO raises a vast array of justified socioeconomic anxieties, including very real anxieties about our environment and the future of our planet, workers' rights, disease rates, corporate control of the food and political systems, and the systemic inequality propping up our society from systemic racism, sexism, and the yet unhealed gaping wounds of the legacies of colonialism, slavery, and environmental destruction around the world. And that might seem like a lot, but from my experience talking about this issue year after year, it really, it really is about all that and more. And because GMO represents so much more than just genetic engineering, and because it can represent so much to different people, um, the, the conversation about GMO is a conversation about all of these things. So in the last few years, much of the polarization around GMO has centered around labeling, and it's now law. The USDA has mandated that all genetically engineered foods or ingredients must be labeled by the end of this year, but what that label will look like is still not settled. Currently, the proposed icons feature the letters BE, which stands for bioengineered, some with a uh, curved line below the letters, uh, which some say resemble, uh, resembles a smiley face, which it kind of does. You can, you can check it out on the USDA website. 
this mandatory labeling decision has driven the pro-GMO camp into a frenzy. They say that these labels stigmatize a useful agricultural technique that can help farmers and people all over the world. And the mandatory labeling decision has also driven the anti-GMO camp into a frenzy. They argue that labels should explicitly carry the term GMO or GE and should not look like a smiley face because that, that is too positive when we're talking about genetic engineering. So now we've come to the culmination of a battle of sorts. But what have we solved? Think about it. What are we solving with this fight? And I'm speaking as much to um, hopefully the people who, who watch this later. We haven't solved anything because, excuse me, all of the socioeconomic issues that GMO raises are systemic and labels by their nature are superficial. So remember I said that we skeptics know how to do our research and to separate truth from fiction, um, and we know how to read and understand a scientific paper. Uh, I would like to let go of that urge for a moment. In other words, yes, it is important as consumers and voters to be educated about food labels and their consequences. But while this battle has raged with ranks on both sides, um, we've forgotten that different values drove us. And now, uh, post-Trump era, and I've heard this raised a few times today, those diverging values have manifested in a divide in the pro-GMO movement. Um, some have condemned and denigrated this divide as infighting and as harmful to a movement that holds science as one of its de dearest values, and surely a movement that is uh, that does fight for the justice of farmers and, and people around the world. So again, I said some have con condemned this divide in the pro-GMO movement as infighting, but it's not infighting. There never really were pro-GMO and anti-GMO sides. There were just people, people with values. Now, one woman who marched with me on my side against the march against Monsanto three years ago, at that time, our shared value in the need to follow science when it comes to food policy um, was, was strong enough to unite us. But this is the same woman, a Trump voter, by the way, I'll just throw that out there, who now fiercely rejects the notion that acknowledging sexism and racism and other structural inequality should drive the way we talk about and shape our food system. To her and others like her, the unity of the pro-GMO movement is more important um, than people like me breaking the pro-GMO ranks to have conversations with so-called anti-GMO enemies on how to achieve goals that we actually all share, um, which uh, include justice in the food system based in the shared value of equity and justice for all. So what I'm saying is, now that our values are becoming more and more apparent in the, in the current political climate, the calls for unity in the pro-GMO movement, which again is an emerging movement um, among the larger skeptics movement, um, these calls for unity are counterproductive and um, detrimental. There won't be unity, and there shouldn't be unity. So what does this mean for Free Thought Day, for the theme of today's Free Thought Day, which is discover reason? As skeptics and as free thinkers, and as people who value what we call reason, I urge you to remember that no issue that we're passionate about, be it GMOs or vaccines or atheism, should require us to walk in lockstep, especially around issues of scientific significance. Remember that while the scientific method may be the way that we interact with the world, largely by choice, the scientific method is wielded by people, and what drives those people are values. And remember that the people who hold the power 
to wield science on a broad scale control that conversation. Thanks. <laughs>